morning and Wednesday evening to you in this uh, somewhat special edition of Weather for Weather Geeks. We're going to do a review of the winter forecast and the winter season, of course, but uh, specifically why the forecast really went sideways. We're going to talk about uh, things we're looking at as we head into spring and even into summer. We're going to take a look at the next you know, couple of seasons and what kind of trends may impact the general vibe of our weather as we go through uh, the growing season in 2023. All right, so the big numbers for the winter season. I mean, this is pretty extraordinary stuff when you have this many near records. Uh, the third warmest winter season on record, the second warmest February, the fifth warmest January, the second least snowy February. And if you thought it was sunnier than it usually is in February, you were right. It was roughly the seventh warmest, or the seventh sunniest, I should say, February on record for our area. All right, so we had an extremely warm winter while we had La Nina. It was the third straight winter in which there was a La Nina. That's the cooling of the waters in the equatorial Pacific Ocean. Uh, the That abnormally cool water can have impacts on the jet stream and weather patterns across North America during winter. The opposite of that is El Nino. That's when there's a warm stripe of water in that same key area in the Pacific. It's not unusual to have a warm winter during a La Nina. It is unusual to have a very warm winter during a La Nina. Our two warmest uh, winters in recent memory uh, were strong El Ninos, uh, 82-83, 97-98 as well. Uh, moderate La Nina, weak La Nina, strong La Nina, down farther on the list, but it's, yeah, it's kind of unusual since 1950 uh, to have kind of a weak La Nina and also a very warm winter. Typically, our coldest winters since 1950 have come during either neutral conditions, no El Nino or La Nina, or a, uh, a relatively weak El Nino. Um, those types of uh, conditions are most common when we have some of our coldest winters on record. The warmest winters on record, though, it's more of a mix, but at the top of the list, strong El Ninos. Uh, this year was not a strong El Nino. It was uh, the opposite. It was kind of a weak La Nina. All right, so when we put out our uh, first winter forecast back in November. This is what we put the odds at for different outcomes. Uh, down at the bottom of the list, hey, at least we didn't put zero, <laughs> but we only gave about a 2% chance uh, at the idea. We threw a 2% chance at that idea that it would be a very warm winter, plus four to plus eight. We ended up about point or a plus a six, I should say, as far as the winter season. So that was the wrong idea. Also the wrong idea in terms of snow. Of course, we've had very little snow. We only gave up about a 5% chance of it being a much below average season. Now we're not done counting flakes just yet. Uh, snowfall, we'll give a grade on that from first flake to last flake, and we haven't seen the last flake of snow yet, but obviously we're way, way behind average as we go into the month of March. So when we put together the winter forecast, you know, part of uh, seasonal forecasting is what we call analoging, looking back at past years and trying to find good matches for what we think the current conditions are and what the conditions are likely to be heading into the winter in the oceans, in the atmosphere. And uh, this is the list we came up with, some of the best analogs. A lot of these were mild winters, but there was one winter that stood out. Uh, that was the winter of 2010-2011. It was a cold and extremely snowy winter. In fact, the snowiest winter on record. This was a good analog for this winter. And I, you know, I, I zigged when I should have zagged here. I, I was scared a little bit by that analog. Um, despite the other top analogs being on the mild side, one of those analogs was very snowy, 0708. The other was near average, 66.7 uh, inches back in 71.72. Uh, we had one paltry winter in the snow department on the top of the list here, 99.2000. As it turns out, that was probably one of the better analogs, even though, of course, it's been less snowy than that and warmer than that. Uh, but I got scared a little bit by that 2010-2011 analog, thinking it was such a good match for this winter that I was hesitant to really go too far in the opposite direction. Uh, and obviously that ended up being kind of the kind of the wrong idea. So in a La Nina winter, it is not unusual to have a warm February. Uh, Southeast Ridge likes to set up shop, and what we mean by that is a big ridge of high pressure over the southeastern U.S. and over towards the Bahamas, the Caribbean. That tends to deflect a lot of the cold to the north and west in February in La Nina's. January, what happened there was a surprise, and that broke the back of the forecast for the winter because January ended up being so warm. We can trace the reasons for the warm January all the way back to Asia. 
And this is something that I, you know, to be honest, I had never really put much thought into until this winter when I started to learn more about this phenomenon. East Asian Mountain Torque. What in the world is that? So basically the idea here is that anomalously strong high pressure builds out of Siberia and heads down into some of the most mountainous terrain on Earth, some of the highest mountains on Earth, across the Himalayas. And the air, that sinking air with high pressure, piles up against those mountains. And it actually, because these mountains are so tall, this can have an impact on the speed of the rotation of the Earth, believe it or not. Uh, it's a small change, but it is a change. And so to compensate for that, the atmosphere speeds up wind speeds, kind of downstream of this, across the Pacific Ocean. In other words, the jet stream becomes stronger over the Pacific. It becomes more elongated. Sometimes the uh, jet stream can uh, take on more of a, you know, kind of a wavy pattern, undulations. Sometimes it's pretty weak, but when you have kind of a fire hose coming across the Pacific like this, strong jet that's not waving very much, that can lead to, you may have heard uh, the term atmospheric river back in January, made the national news, a storm after storm pounded California and the Pacific Northwest and generally the West Coast of North America. So you get this fire hose of, of moisture coming across the Pacific, led to a lot of stormy weather in the, uh, in the Western US. That, you know, just basically floods the North American continent with Pacific air, not Arctic air. It cuts off kind of the cold air supply a little bit, coming into at least the Eastern US. And so the West is cold and stormy, the East not so much. You know, we generally think this is kind of what happened. Uh, this East Asian mountain torque phenomenon in Asia really started back in December, um, but it had its biggest impacts on the weather heading into January. And I think that's the culprit behind why January turned out to be the way it did. And it, again, it kind of broke the back of the winter forecast, made for a, a lousy forecast, not only from me, but just about every other winter forecast, with maybe an exception or two, um, just about every other winter forecast I saw gave no indication that this would be a blowtorch kind of a winter. All right, let's look ahead to spring. This is the uh, climate, for, uh, climate Prediction Center's forecast for meteorological spring, March, April, and May. Now, as you probably know by now, we're expecting a chilly March. Uh, it may end up being colder than February. In fact, odds probably favor that, in, in fact. Uh, so today's 64. We're not going to see many days like that, it looks like, coming up throughout the month of March. But for meteorological spring, uh, warmth is favored. I, I suspect this will rely heavily upon the second half of spring, because I think the first half of spring is likely to be on the chilly side. The CPC guidance for, uh, this should say, uh, March, April, May, instead of December, January, February, and the banner. So ignore the banner. But this is the spring outlook for precipitation. Uh, Odds are favoring wetter than average conditions, and again, I kind of suspect that is uh, relying more on one part of the season than the other. I, I think the first half of spring is likely to be pretty wet. A little worried about the second half of spring and into the summer being drier. I'm going to talk about that more in, in just a moment. Uh, we're going to ignore this. Uh, what we're looking at here are some computer models uh, dealing with uh, La Nina and El Nino. And La Nina, its days are numbered, it's dying, it's going to fade away quickly in the coming weeks, and there's a pretty good chance that we're going to see El Nino developing. And the question for our longer range forecast, specifically as we get into summer, uh, is does El Nino form? Uh, and if it does, when exactly does it form? How strong is it? Because that can make a big difference when it comes to our summertime weather across our region. Here's a, a bunch of computer models. Kind of the middle or the mean of these models is right in through here. Here's all our months down here. And about 0.5 is kind of the magic number we would think of uh, as it being officially El Nino, 0.5 above average as far as the water temperatures go. Uh, most of our models are, or at least a, a fair amount of them, you know, just about the mean of all these models or the average, tries to get El Nino going by about the middle of summer. This is June, July, August right here. Uh, and so I think there's a pretty good chance that we're, we're going to see El Nino by the summer. And when you look at the temperature composite for the lower 48 states in recent El Nino summers, while the signal is not as strong in eastern Ohio and western PA as it is in other parts of the country, the overall flavor of the uh, summer is kind of cool uh, in recent El Ninos. Um, and again, this is for El Ninos, and then this is for ENSO neutral conditions. Again, ignore the text I forgot to delete. <laughs> uh, 
and so neutral being neither La Nina or El Nino. So if we have a neutral summer, El Nino isn't in a hurry to get going. It waits until the fall, maybe. This is the most recent uh, uh, trends as far as summer temperatures go. Not much of a signal locally, but the flavor across the U.S. would favor more warmth in an Enso neutral summer. So a pretty big difference in temperatures. There's also a big difference in the precipitation department. Here's a look at the most recent El Nino summers composite. Uh, some summers were wet locally, but the average of all the recent El Nino summers, kind of a dry signal across a lot of the region and up into New England. Just about a mirror image of this is the composite map for Enso neutral summers, neither El Nino or La Nina. If El Nino doesn't form this summer, it would be Enso neutral. And it's kind of the opposite map. It's kind of a wet signal in eastern Ohio and up into New England. It's drier out across the Corn Belt. So it's pretty important when El Nino forms, how strong it is, but especially when it forms. Is it going to form? Is it going to take shape by the summer or does it wait till the fall? If it takes shape by summer, uh, we could have a pretty dry summer uh, coming up. And, you know, there's some model data. You know, you take all model data this far out with a little bit of a grain of salt. But there's some model idea that backs up the idea that a dry summer could be in the cards for us. This is the latest CanSips model. Hot off the press. This just came out today. This is for summer, June, July, August, showing a dry signal across across our region. So uh, if you're a farmer, if you have agricultural interests, even if you're just a recreational gardener, uh, this may be you know some interesting information. Now, again, take it with a grain of salt. Today's March 1st. Uh, we're talking about the summer. Uh, we still got to get through spring. But it is interesting to look at some of this stuff and look at what is a uh, possibility. I mentioned online today on social media that I wouldn't rule out that today's 64 is the warmest temperature we see for the rest of March. I wouldn't put money on that, but I wouldn't rule it out at this point. I don't see a lot of mid-60s coming our way anytime real soon. Might try to pop a 60 or so uh, coming up next Monday. But I don't see many days like this uh, coming in the, uh, in the medium range because I do think it's a pretty darn chilly pattern as we get into mid-March. In the meantime... A couple of showers out there this evening with our weak cool front pushing through in the wake of this front. A decent day coming up on Thursday. And then here comes our rainy day Friday. Boy, this is a clunker on Friday. Boy, stay inside. Uh, take care of those indoor projects because not only is it going to be raining for most of the day, it's going to be mostly in the 30s with a brisk wind. It's just going to be raw and cold and damp. And could there be a sleep pellet or a snowflake, especially as this precipitation pushes in around midday Friday? That's possible. Not expecting any impacts from anything other than rain. It's just rain for a lot of the day. And then a couple of showers will linger into Friday night and a gloomy Saturday. Clouds, maybe a rain or a snow shower. I think Sunday will be a better day. Now, our rainfall expectations have lowered some over the last 24 hours or so. I think a good average for our region will be about an inch. Could someone see an inch and a half? Yes, but uh, two inches is probably pushing it for us. That's a little more likely out in western Ohio, but a good inch on average. Maybe enough to cause some rivers and creeks and streams to start running a little bit high by Friday and Friday night, even though major flooding issues locally do, do not seem likely. Again, we start probably on the mild side early next week, and then the uh, colder pattern really starts to show its, its hand, I think, or it starts to show up big time, I think. To go towards the second half of next week. That doesn't mean we're going to have highs in the teens or anything like that, but compared to the average, yeah, many, many chilly days ahead of us as we go into mid-March. Will it snow? Well, yes, at some point it will. We are not done with snow for the season, that is for sure, but I don't see anything coming over the next week in the foreseeable future. Nothing we can hang our hat on as far as any, uh, any big ticket snow chances. All right, that's a long enough video for tonight. Thanks for hanging with me. Thanks for your patience, everyone. I'll see you back here on Thursday.